It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Mary Bassett. Um, Dr. Bassett has worked extensively in Sub-Saharan Africa and in New York City at the New York City Health Department, where she's now our health commissioner, I'm very happy to say. Um, she and I have actually overlapped at the DOH, but we actually met through our Africa-based work uh, when she was running the uh, Doris Duke African Health Initiative. Um, it's very significant for us, I think, to have someone um, speak to us from her unique vantage point of both leadership and from the perspective of years in the trenches of this epidemic. Um, and Mary is a, a thought leader in health equity and health disparities, as evidenced by numerous high-profile publications, um, including a recent paper in The Lancet on structural racism and health, health inequities in the US. Um, so we are honored and thrilled to have New York City's Commissioner of Health, uh, Dr. Mary Bassett, um, at, at this event. Um, we are uh, also very pleased to have the support of the DOH um, on many levels for this CIFAR. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, Mary. Welcome. Thank you, and good afternoon. When I first uh, got the invitation from Dennis, I thought this would be a great chance to say how important it is to the health department that we have trans university uh, coalitions working on important public health issues. And then I thought it would be really important to say how important the NIH investment has been in, uh, in HIV. As you all know, the budget is under threat and how important it is for us all to join our voices. Then I saw Tony Fauci would be here, so you don't need to hear any of that from me. What I'm gonna talk about instead is how important science is to the work that we do. But I wanna add to that that the science is not enough. Uh, that in order to end the AIDS epidemic, we have to reach bodies, and to do that, is not only a matter of science. And I think Tony Fauci actually exemplifies that. I was sorry uh, that I didn't get to catch his, uh, his talk. But if uh, we happened to both give TED Talks in the same session, and he talked about how he, a leader in bench research at the NIH, came to realize that if he kept the activists at bay and out of the conversation, that not only would the work be harried and hassled as he was being, but that the science wouldn't be as good. So it's an incredibly moving talk, and I would urge you all to take a look at it. Uh, but I'm so excited to talk about the work that the health department is doing, because I believe that the science has brought us within reach of ending this epidemic without a vaccine. We can do this. Uh, so, let me get started. Dennis has already mentioned that I spent, spent a big chunk of my working life in Southern Africa. Uh, but I started out in clinical medicine at Harlem Hospital, where I did my residency training, where I saw my first patient with AIDS. I went on to Zimbabwe, which had one of the largest HIV epidemics in the world. And much of my work there uh, focused on AIDS. And it was there that I learned, really, the how epidemics track along the fissures of a society. Uh, and in Zimbabwe had a great deal to do with migrant labor, uh, gender inequality, and poverty. So I came back to the United States and I uh, worked at the health department for some years. I've been I'm in my fourth year as health commissioner. One of the first things that I talked about was that we were gonna continue and bolster our excellence at a department. You all know that we're, that you've got the best health department. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> but one thing that we have to acknowledge is that our relationship with advocates was often a tense one. And I said in my opening email to the staff at the health department that we were going to apply an equity lens to all that we do and that we were going to work to ensure that we had community engagement in a genuine sense. So I'm so proud of the fact that the health department has uh, come such a long way. This guy looking like an advocate, and he is on your left, is now the head of our disease control activities. He came into the health department as the 
as the uh, Assistant Commissioner for HIV and AIDS. And we have really um, transformed our relationship to the advocacy community. We had ACT UP come and show us the film, How to Survive a Plague. And uh, we now consider ourselves allies in our goal of ending AIDS. And together with activists, we have been able to marshal enormous political will here in New York City. Uh, I would say that this uh, combination of the data, the science, and the activism has resulted in New York City being one of the handful of really fully funded jurisdictions where we have the funds to hand. Uh, to pursue the goal jointly endorsed by both our governor and our mayor, something that happens, um, uh, to end the epidemic by 2020. So this has been our goal, and I'm going to tell you some of the ways that we're doing it, but I first want to show you uh, how we're on track to achieve these uh, goals. You, can see here the uh, red bars represent new HIV, um, uh, sorry, total new HIV diagnoses, but only a subset of them are incident HIV infections. Our goal to reach the New York City portion, and we have 80% of HIV in the state right here in New York City, uh, is uh, 600 incident HIV infections. So I hope you'll see from this graph with, where in 2015, our most recently announced data, uh, we for the first time uh, since we collected these data have fewer than 2,500 cases. Uh, of those, about 1,500 were incident, and I hope you'll see that we are on track uh, to um, to the goal of 600. So while it's an ambitious goal, I believe that it is a possible goal, and that is the magic number where we believe that we would end, uh, that the reproduction ratio would be low enough that we would end transmission um, in the city. So that's where we're going. But of course, we all know that HIV, although it is decreasing annually, that there are groups that are more highly affected than others. Uh, the bar chart here shows that this is still largely an epidemic of young men who have sex with men who are Latinx or black, uh, and that it tracks with poverty. So our goal is to see what, was to look and see what resources we have as an agency that will allow us to deliver uh, the most cutting edge treatments now available to us uh, and reach this population. Because as I say, ending HIV is not going, not going to be like putting fluoride in the water, something that we can just do and not have to reach people. We have to find a way to reach people at risk, to reach people who are infected, to link and keep people in care. Uh, so what we turned to were what we have recently rebranded as our sexual health clinics. And I'm going to spend the remainder of my talk uh, talking about how we transformed what were known as STD clinics into sexual health clinics and how in another goal that I've had as commissioner, we got the HIV people who have money to give up some of their funding to the STD people who don't. And we have succeeded as a department in acknowledging that we have to get rid of some of these silos and acknowledge that uh, in order to a a achieve our goal, we sometimes uh, need to share and not, uh, and not uh, keep the funding where it was allocated originally. So the Bureau of HIV and the Bureau of STDs have different goals, but they both agreed that this a uh, map that you see here uh, represented a huge resource. These are the eight uh, clinics that we have across the city, which have uh, recently re been rebranded as sexual health clinics. You can see that we have broad coverage, including in neighborhoods where we know that people need better access to care. Uh, and also that we you know, more or less, except for Staten Island cover, which they never stop reminding us about. Um, uh, cover the whole city. Uh, so we set about changing the scope of activities, 
uh, lengthening the clinic hours, including full-time clinics. So some of these clinics used to only be open a couple days a week. Who can remember that, that it's open on you know Monday, Wednesday, Friday? Uh, we, dis we decided that we'd reopen all of them, uh, include evening hours, and uh, in some cases, in two, two of the clinics, uh, weekend, Saturday hours. Uh, so uh, they are now um, being promoted, and some of you ride the subway. Uh, I don't know if you do that to get to this section of the Bronx. You probably, I, I yeah. Um, some of you who ride the subways may have seen this campaign. Um, one of the reporters, when we launched it, uh, described it as cheeky, <laughs> and uh, the tagline is, we've got you covered. It has, like, it's funny. Um, it, it's uh, lighthearted, and in, in keeping with our goal of, uh, of having sex-friendly um, uh, campaigns and acknowledge that we want people to have healthy sexual lives. We don't want to judge them. We want to just make sure that they are, are healthy. Uh, so we um, are, uh, have re changed all of our signs, changed the way that we talk about our clinics. And let me first, before I tell you all the new things that we're doing in the clinic, tell you who we serve in these clinics. Uh, we identify 10% of the new HIV infections in the city. We have a massive healthcare delivery system of which these clinics are really just a small section, but that's a pretty large share of the new HIV infections. Uh, we uh, identify 20% of seroconverters. We are a safety net clinics. People come into our clinic and are not interviewed first about what their insurance coverage is. They get their care first. We try to recover funding when, uh, from insurance companies when it's possible. Uh, and we are now beginning to use probably, I'm sure that Dr. Fauci talked about some of these, although for you all they may be old time, some of the new strategies of immediately starting people on antiretroviral drug treatment when they're newly diagnosed, um, and uh, also strengthening our ability to get people into long-term full primary care. So we found out whether our patients would be interested in these services when they came to the STD clinic. And among the HIV negative uh, patients, we found that many of them would be interested in PrEP. Um, and we also know uh, that um, additionally, this is a great setting to get people all sorts of social services in addition to treating their acute um, uh, uh, STDs. Uh, additionally, we know that we're reaching a population that's extremely high risk. Uh, the most recent data, I think the most stunning statistic, uh, and I don't mean that in a good way, uh, is at the bottom of this slide, that one in 15 men who are seen in our clinics and diagnosed with anorectal chlamydia or gonorrhea uh, will uh, be diagnosed with HIV uh, within a year. So we know that we're reaching people who really need to consider augmenting the preventive strategies that they have, uh, have um, um, available to them. First thing that we did was um, expand PEP. Uh, we now have uh, uh, full 28 days. When I became commissioner, we gave people three days and said, go find your doctor. Uh, that's not really practical for many people. We give people the full 28 days. We put in place the laboratory capacity to track it. Uh, we also, when we identify someone who is interested and wants to start PrEP, we start them on PrEP, and we are beginning to manage their PrEP as well as starting them on, anti on antiretroviral therapy if they are HIV infected. So that's uh, what uh, our funding and our increase, I mean, we've increased our capacity, you know, tripled our clinicians and so on uh, to do this. Uh, so that's what um, uh, the, uh, the offering of bi cutting edge biomedical interventions, but we also know that many of the people who come to us wouldn't identify HIV prevention as their number one issue. Some of them will say housing 
or uh, getting insurance access. So we want to make those connections available. And we are not uh, trying to become the full doctor for these patients. Uh, we are uh, ha navigate them uh, to, um, to long-term care. Uh, some of you may have seen our most recent public campaign. It's called Bear It All. Have you seen any of this? Uh, which is, encourages people to uh, make sure that they can talk with their doctors uh, about their whole lives, including their sex lives, and if they have a doctor who's not comfortable talking to them, to get another doctor. And we have gotten put together the lists of doctors to, um, to refer people. So this really has, um, uh, has transformed the way we're offering care. Uh, it's enabled us to, um, to start reaching people, and we already know that we're succeeding. Uh, the PrEP navigation, we have over 1,900 encounters. We have started uh, uh, six, over 600 patients on, on, uh, on PEP, uh, and the majority of them are either black or Latino. Uh, Jumpstart is what we're calling our rapid HIV initiation. We started in one clinic uh, in the fall of last year. Uh, we've now started nearly 100 patients, at least at the time this slide was made, and we um, are now um, uh, uh, also have data um, that we're reaching this population that many people claim is so hard to reach. Uh, finally, we uh, started PrEP initiation in our clinics. Uh, we are now doing it in two of our clinics and we plan to extend. And again, uh, we're finding counter to what some people have argued. Uh, that the black and Latino populations aren't interested in PrEP, uh, that we are getting a, 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 a good interest and that the majority of the patients who have started on, on PrEP uh, in our hands are either black or Latino. So these really are saying that whatever you come in the door for, uh, whether we want you to know what your HIV status is, whatever your status is, is really not interesting to us. What's interesting to us is tailoring the care to meet your needs and your life. Uh, and um, we're, we're doing a bunch of other things with this. I'm not sure that I've put all the slides in for that. We've instituted asymptomatic screens so you can come into the clinic and say, you know, you don't have to say I have a complaint. You can just say, I'm here to get checked. And you can um, get basically pee in a cup and do some swabs and we'll tell you what you're, whether you need to um, concern yourself uh, with, with anything. And we're identifying, needless to say, syphilis and uh, gonorrhea and chlamydia in that way. Uh, of course, we have uh, an interest in also uh, making sure that we reach out to the populations that we know are at particular risk. And we've made big strides in reaching the trans population and the LGBTQ uh, populations. But in particular, uh, we want to make sure that when the community comes to us saying we have a methamphetamine problem, that we begin to address that. We don't say it's not really showing up on our surveys because we trust the community, which is probably uh, not going to show up on our citywide surveys, to have identified new needs. Uh, this is a campaign in the middle of the screen that is aimed directly at the, uh, at the rise in methamphetamine use. Uh, we want to support organizations. Uh, we have now uh, begun giving people funding, uh, not to deliver services, but to deliver organizational capacity. Because many of these are small groups where people don't really know how to draw, write up a budget uh, or, um, or how to, you know, they're not standard partners for the health department. So we are now funding some of these organizations so that they can uh, uh, achieve organizational capacity so that they can begin to work with us on performance-based contracts. So the first step is in to deliver services. 
but to deliver enhanced organizational uh, capacity. And this is all part of the idea that, um, that HIV is not the central issue of many of the groups that we work with. They confront many other problems concerning stigma, discrimination, uh, housing, mental health, and we want to become a gateway for everyone who walks in the door and at the same time identify and offer enhanced services. So we believe that this is positioning us well to, um, to continue to see reductions in new HIV cases in New York City. And I just want to take a moment to also point out that this is part of an overarching theme uh, that we've adopted at the health department to uh, take as a central commitment of our agency and of public health more generally, that we acknowledge the gaps by race and income in health outcomes in our city, that we describe these as unjust, unnecessary, and ones that we can change, so that we have engaged as an agency in, um, in, in uh, training ourselves in how to address these questions uh, and rejecting the kind of fatalistic notion that some communities in this city are condemned to high rates of HIV. That's not uh, consistent with the goal that all of us uh, will seek to promote and protect our health and that the health department's goal is to ensure that we advance uh, that process by building partnerships and using science. So with that, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, yes, Commissioner? Yes. Yes. Um, I came across a very interesting article in the New York Times. It was called America's Hidden HIV Epidemic. And one of the things that drew my attention to that wonderful article basically was a lot of statistics that are going on with HIV in the South. Yes. Um, I have worked with patients in various agencies, and I've seen that kind of migration from the South seeking services here in New York City yes. because they're not providing them in the South, particularly states like Mississippi and um, Atlanta, Florida. Uh, so my question is, toppled with that migration and also immigrants that are coming to New York City as well from Central and South America with HIV that we, we are trying to, to identify, and also with the cuts of the Affordable Care Act, which really limits accessibility to health care. So how is New York City going to be prepared to address that epidemic and that crisis if we're really moving towards the 2020 goal? Well, the first thing to say is we, uh, uh, we absolutely acknowledge the need for support in southern uh, departments of health. So our health department has been working with those departments on some of these innovative strategies that, we, uh, that I've uh, shown you today. I mean, your larger question is what will the impact be of the, uh, of the policy changes that we're uh, hearing promised by Washington for our city, and which might deprive one and a half million people of health insurance. Uh, we remain a safety net operation. People can come to our health department without having health insurance and be served. Uh, and with, uh, for those who do have insurance and who are unable to pay, we will not turn them away. Uh, we will offer them all services. So, uh, you know, the question is, who's going to pay for it? And uh, right now, what I'm describing to you is paid for by all of you. Oh, Dr. Blank is in the audience. Ah, this is Dr. Blanks, who's led the transformation of the uh, sexual health clinics for the city. So, anyway, she deserves a round of applause, everybody. Um, so, 
the, right now, the, you know, the, um, both the governor and the uh, mayor together put in over, uh, about $24 million a year into these expansion of these services. Have I got that right? Yes. Uh, so, the, um, so this is your tax dollars uh, that are paying for this. So I don't consider it at risk at the moment. Uh, but I would uh, say that we as a city and a society are at risk. And the position of this administration is that we will continue to fight back against these proposed changes in policy from Washington. So we haven't announced new strategies to meet a trimmed budget uh, because we haven't accepted that budget. And none of us should. I don't know if this is a question or a comment, but the resources have to be commensurate with the rhetoric, and justice costs money, and the prices of the, you know, as we promote our public health agendas, we're being saddled with huge pharmaceutical costs. I feel my job as a physician in an HIV clinic doing both ART on the spot and PrEP and PEP, my biggest job is navigating the insurance for patients, anyone who comes to New York from any, people are coming in from other places with generic drugs that they're getting for free. In uh, Jamaica, in the Dominican Republic, I think those are the only two places I can be absolutely sure of, but I, I don't know how we're going to sustain this mission given the costs of drugs, and this is even more so with hepatitis C. People are being tested in droves, but the reality is, we don't have an easy way of getting drugs that isn't exhausting and wastefully time consuming. And I think that unless we address this question up front, we're not gonna be able to sustain all of the wonderful progress that we've made. And I completely, I'm the biggest fan of the health department. So I'm just wondering where we're gonna go in terms of cost and the, and the, um, the real migration to New York from all over, not just from the South. Well, the first thing to say, I mean, I think that's a very good point, so she deserves the, the scattered applause. That, <laughs> that um, yes, please. Uh, and uh, pharmaceutical uh, prices are uh, just uh, unbelievably high, uh, and that's uh, something that, uh, that the president has said that he wants to work on, so let's see. The, uh, but I would say that that we do, many of these drugs are covered by insurance. Um, and the problem is the people who are underinsured or uninsured. And we have noticed this problem as well. <laughs> and so we're beginning, we, you know, I, I don't, there's not a simple uh, answer, but part of it must be uh, that when we, uh, that when we seek bulk procurement strategies, we do better in pricing. So just to give you an example, uh, as you probably know, we have a real effort to address the opioid uh, crisis in the city. Uh, and when we went to the market, because we are aiming to distribute 100,000 doses of naloxone every year, we were able to get a much lower price because of our bulk procurement. So, um, so I don't have an answer uh, for you, but I wouldn't describe what we're doing as rhetoric. Uh, these are real services uh, that are on offer to our clinics, and you're welcome to refer your patients to us. Uh, if, uh, you know, if you are, you know, we'll do our best with any patients who come our way. Yes? Particularly for PEP, PrEP, uh, I've, and I think I should ask uh, Sue if she wants to add anything, or have I covered it? Right, it's actually against, uh, right, it's an executive order that no city services, uh, that, uh, that you can't be asked about your immigration status. So it's not just our preference as a health department, which I believe it would be, it is uh, backed up by a mayoral order. Yes, how are you? Hi, Good Dr. Bassett, you. so happy you're here uh, giving this talk. Um, so I'm Chinazo Cunningham, and a clinician, and I do mostly research on drug use and HIV. And um, 
So I'm very glad you brought up the issue of drug use. We're in the Bronx, and drug use has driven HIV for decades. Um, finally, we, we were getting attention with the opioid epidemic, um, and I appreciate a lot of the effort that the New York City Department of Health is, is doing in terms of the opioid epidemic. But you brought up methamphetamine. And so, you know, we talk a lot about opioids, and we actually have treatment that works, but what about all the other drugs? Uh, and how is the Department of Health really going to address these? Because I think, you know, this is something that I personally have been frustrated with. When we talk about HIV, we really sort of compartmentalize, and we really don't talk about the root causes as, as, as one of your slides really addressed. You're right that our focus has been on, uh, principally on opioids uh, as, uh, as the leading preventable cause of overdose deaths in the city. I think that the data make it necessary that we have a focused effort on, on opioids. And uh, as you're well aware, uh, we have uh, also gotten new resources to address that. Uh, but we're, in, we're concerned about other substance use. We're concerned about alcohol, for example, not just illicit drugs, but uh, also uh, so that is, uh, is another conversation, but we have some resources. Whether they're enough, I won't tell you that they're enough, but it's not that we have nothing. The, uh, the department oversees and contracts with substance use providers across the city, and we have some resources. Uh, so I would take it as a good first step that we have worked with the community to uh, sound the alarm about methamphetamines and develop referral pathways for people to get care. Uh, none of what we do is probably as much as what we need to do. Uh, but all of it, I would argue, is a step in the right direction and a considerable step. Uh, Dr. Blank, from the audience, I can't offer you a mic, but maybe you... I, I need to turn you over to the people who do this work all the time. So, Dr. Blank. <laughs> closer to your, just closer. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Sue Blank. I am that person who is uh, with the health department and the assistant commissioner at the Bureau of STD Control and responsible for the sexual health clinics. And I just wanted to amplify what Dr. Bassett was saying insofar as within sexual health in that in that move from just STD care to sexual health. Along the way, we've also begun to walk the walk and uh, screening brief interventions and referral to treatment as far as alcohol and other substance use does occur in our clinics with every patient visit. And um, with our ending the epidemic, we have not only brought on navigators, but we are now able with a cadre of social workers to begin to address some of the problems these very determinant issues as far as um, just personal health and for HIV control and S other STI prevention. Thank you. Uh, you know, I would point out that all of us work at what we do, some of you in research, some of you in direct patient care, uh, those of us in the health department, uh, but because we believe that we can have an impact before we end racism and end poverty. We can do better than we're doing right now. And in that way, also contribute from the health perspective to the goal of ending racism and ending poverty. So I don't wanna have us walk, I, I very much uh, am in favor of thinking about the totality of people's lives and how these place them at risk in so many ways. But that shouldn't make us despair. It should make us determined. So the, you know, we, we're endeavoring to step up, um, but uh, I wouldn't say that, um, that we have accomplished everything. That's the, the mantra of public health, progress and a long way to go. How are you?
I'm fine, Dr. Bassett. How are you? Uh, I just wanted to ask an overall question because at the same time the budget for AIDS has gone up by $24 million. Uh, the health department budget for chronic disease, particularly diabetes, has gone down by half or more. And that's the most prevalent disease. It affects everyone. Indeed, people with AIDS are at two to four times higher risk for diabetes. And I wondered, isn't that a contradiction and somewhat of an imbalance in looking at disparities? Well, if you're here to advocate for more funding for public health, no commissioner would ever say that that wouldn't be a great idea. Uh, but I know that we're going to be having a meeting. Uh, you're going to be meeting with people at the department. I don't think that I quite agree with the numbers that you've given, uh, but there is no doubt that we now have a health uh, of a population living with HIV that is now reaching the point of also uh, confronting other chronic diseases because uh, in addition to chronic HIV infection, they, may, they are at risk for all the other chronic diseases that uh, lead uh, mortality in our city. So uh, absolutely we are committed to tackling uh, diabetes in the city. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Bassett. Um, I'm wondering, since we're in here in a Center for AIDS Research, if you might address the kind of issues around research that you see that, and that we can have a collaborative relationship on research and during through this kind of Collab this uh, CFAR that has so much basic science as well as the public health and the right. clinical services. I guess that I have to confess that although I worked in HIV for a long time, I haven't kept up with the science. So J Dennis was whispering me to me about neutralizing antibodies and using three of them may work, like multi-drug therapy for uh, an antiretroviral treatment. Uh, I'm really excited about the possibility that um, that PrEP may become uh, possible with long-acting formulations. You know, I think of PrEP in some ways, and I was initial skeptic, right? We have condoms, condoms work. Why not just keep plugging away at encouraging people to use condoms? And we hand out 37 million New York City branded condoms a year. Uh, but like uh, pregnancy prevention, the more opportunities people have to tailor their prevention method to their needs, the more likely we are to get a population that is covered in the way that it wants to be uh, against HIV infection. So uh, PrEP offers an additional, um, an, an additional um, method, but everyone knows that taking pills every day is hard. It's hard for everybody. Doesn't matter your uh, you know, who you are, what your income is, adherence to daily medication treatment is terrible. So it would be really great if we could get long-acting formulations working. And of course we need, uh, you know, so I would say that I'm probably not going to have any interesting basic science ideas to offer you, but I bet you got a lot of them from Dr. Fauci. But uh, in HIV, having new classes of drugs is great. We still for example, one of the things that we're doing that the advocates got funded, I would say, uh, because, uh, is, um, is doing um, you know, the fingerprinting of, uh, of viruses. Our goal eventually is to really have a library of circulating viruses uh, so that we could identify people who are, uh, have multi, have have viruses that are resistant to the drugs that we use for PrEP and tell them that PrEP's not going to work for your partner if your partner's HIV negative, for example. So, but it would be great also to continue to expand the armamentarium of antiretroviral drugs, but I think that's probably pretty applied. And are we finished? Oh, Yeah. Well, that's what I think I've uh, tried to show how we're using the resources at our disposal. But it, it, fundamental to this idea is the idea that we have to reach out to communities that have been hard to reach and not describe them as unreachable, but use the tools that we have, like 
the department's clinics, which already have a trusting relationship, and how important it is to build trusting relationships with advocates. Uh, this is just as important as the cutting edge science. If we can't deliver it to the populations that we seek to serve because they don't trust us, because they think we may be experimenting on them, and these are concerns that are not hysterical, but are based on a history uh, uh, in this country, we have to, you know, if we don't acknowledge that there's reason for mistrust, that we are going to have to win trust and not simply demand it. I don't think that our implementation strategies will work. So the other things are making it easy, walk in the door, making it as barrier free as possible for people to get the services. So I, I agree with implementation science and I wish I knew more about what you got funded to do, which I apologize that I don't. No. Excellent. Oh, <laughs> okay. Great. Great, and uh, I think also that um, uh, that this whole idea, I mean, if we get down to 600 cases, we should be really able to map them, right? I mean, that's not that many. So the surveillance role, um, uh, in, uh, in prevention remains a very real one. So, all right, thank you.